Like sometimes the agenda has to be sidestepped because when a person is in a place of struggle, they can't be effective. And it's not that they're a bad, it's like they're a human. Welcome to Vibecast, the podcast that dives deep into the heartbeat of workplace culture. I'm your host, Christy Skutvin. Join me in conversations with extraordinary leaders as we unravel their experiences, both positive and negative, that have impacted workplace culture. This podcast is more than storytelling. It's about actionable insights. Are you ready to transform the vibe at your workplace? Let's go. Today, I had the pleasure of chatting with Rosie Ward. She is the CEO and co-founder of Salveo Partners, which is a consulting and professional development firm that guides organizations to create thriving workplace cultures, enhance organizational performance, and cultivate employee well-being with the goal of rehumanizing the workplace so people can bring their best selves to work and home each day. Salveo Partners was originally founded in 2006 by Rosie as a side hustle. She put it on hold for several years when she accepted a full-time position in consulting. However, when that work environment became toxic, Rosie experienced firsthand the ill effects it had on her well-being. She knew it was time to resurrect Salveo, envisioning a world where her poor work experience was no longer the norm. Okay, Rosie, so we have a different spin on today. I'm so happy to have you on because I've been talking with leaders and coaches and lots of different people about articulating a vibe in the workplace and like what that looks like in sharing stories. But in this episode, we really have something unique. And, you know, you took on the challenge of 75 vibes and living that out and, and, taking it for a spin. And so um, now we're at the place where we get to talk about like what that journey was like, what you learned from it, you know, where, where it may have needed some tweaks from your side and kind of what the whole entire purpose of it is. So I think before we dive into that story, which I'm so excited about, I would just like to start out and you helping me understand and the listeners, like how you describe a vibe. What does that mean to you? And what does that look like to you in the workplace and in life? I, I love that. I, I, I love the vibe question. And I think for me, it really just comes down to it's kind of a sense of energy. It's that subtlety is beneath the surface. It is, you know, like spidey sense, if you will. Um, you know, it's that old iceberg analogy that we only see, you know, 10% above the f- surface and 90% beneath. It is what is the beneath the surface. And when you walk into a room physically or virtually, Can you read the room? What kind of sense are you getting? Are people, you know, fulfilled and happy and optimistic and hopeful and full of energy? Or is it, do they look like they would rather die and be anywhere (laughs) but where they are? And I think that, you know, individuals you're with, then you say, well, we're vibing off each other. Like we've got an energy that's in sync and, you know, there's a vibe of, gosh, you know, Debbie Downer negativity. So I, I view it in terms of energy. I view it in terms of that subtlety beneath the surface, which really feeds into culture, which is my jam, right? It's like, what is the vibe of the organization or the team? I mean, that's really that that culture. So like we use an analogy of the river, like a river, everything you can see, touch and feel is kind of like environment, but the current beneath the surface is really what culture is. It's that underlying mindset. It's an underlying vibe. It's an underlying energy. So that's kind of the way that I like to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And people, it's so hard to define, right? Because it is that like feeling or energy and people are like, well, how do you get that? Or how do you create it? Or how do you change it? And that was really kind of like the precipice of the 75 vibes that I put together, right? Is like, it's like the tiny habits that create the big impact. So I want to hear from you, like that was the intention of it. And that's what we talked about. And I know you, you went on this journey. So start me out with like telling me more about how you got started as you looked at this 75 vibes and said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take it on. Yeah. Well, so I am a total, like, if I say I'm going to do something like, all right, like I'm going to figure this out. Right. When you and I met, I said, sure, this, this makes total sense. Of course we want to focus on these things. And so, you know, I always have to find my own way of do doing things. Anyone that's familiar with the Y Institute, I'm a Y of challenge. So of course I'm going to make it my own way of doing things. But so I looked at the little 
you know, calendar, not calendar, but the little grid or whatever that you gave. And I was like, okay, that, that doesn't work for me. So I thought, okay, like I always have my Google drive open. And so I opened up a Google, Google doc and I kind of started creating like journal entries and like the date and like the headings of the different areas, you know, so mindset, connect, learn, breathe, reflect, and like, okay, I'm going to start uh, journaling. And I did that initially. And it was actually really helpful because it forced me to kind of pay attention. And I'm a, I'm a reflector. I used to be a big journaler. I'm not a huge journaler anymore, but I do a lot of like reflecting. And then I have documents where I house ideas, like whether it's for one of my Rosie in my pockets or a blog or so I have areas where my repository, but I, um, I do more just reflecting rather than, than the journaling like I used to. And so what was interesting for me is, you know, as I got through it uh, and I started doing it and a a couple of weeks in, I was like, this is great. And then it started to become, I don't have time to journal. And it was starting to stress me out, (laughs) which is the opposite of what it's supposed to have. And so I was like, okay, I understand the intent of this. So what I did do is I went back and I looked and I actually have it pulled up here and I looked back at my initial journals. And here's the thing, by having something where I'm going to deliberately pay more attention to it, right? I don't like, I don't like the idea of habits. I like deliberate practices. And so when I was like, okay, like mindset is easy for me, you know, reflect is easy for me. The breathe is easy for me. What I realized that where I fall short when my life gets busy is connection. Although I'm such a people person is the first thing that goes out the window. And I write about this in, in the books we have, and I've been very open about this, that when I get in busy mode, when I get in stress mode, I get into hyper-independent, hyper-productive, I call it pain in the ass, get stuff done mode. And what it does is I take on way more than I can handle. And then I do the, nope, I got it. Nope, I got it. Nope, I got it. And then what happens is I'm not fully present with the people that matter to me, or I'm canceling out of, you know, social plans and I get very work focused and I lose sight of the stuff that actually really matters. And so what this did for me was, and I even wrote it down, I was like, oh, I'm forgetting how great it is to like be present and connect with friends and oh, do this. Or, and so it was really like, oh, I'm being more intentional to be more present with people. And that was what kept coming up for me over and over and over. And I forgot how good this is. And I need to really spend time with this. And then the other thing that came up for me as I looked back at when I was journaling was the learning. And I'm always kind of, um, I'm a lifelong learner, but also when I get into hyper productive, I call it human doing rather than human being mode, I will skip appointments that I have on my calendar for like attending a webinar or learning or reflecting or the stuff that I know matters. But then I'm like, oh, okay. What I notice is I feel more reactive. I'm not operating from a place of calm when calm I know is a leadership superpower. Like it's the, I'm getting in my own way. And so for me, it was recognizing. So then as I sat and I had this insight, I'm like, okay, when I spend more deliberate attention on meaningfully connecting with people and don't let my schedule get the best of me. When I also don't let my schedule get the best of me and I'm having more intentionality around protecting the learning and reflecting time, that's when I show up as my best. Like the other stuff was already there. I'm like, okay. And so then I thought, okay, well, this is stupid. Like I've had that insight and now what? I'm going to add another to do on my list, which is counterproductive of what the insights I had and then keep this journal going. And I was like, well, that's just dumb. (laughs) That's literally what I just said. And I was like, and I'm pretty sure this defeats the purpose of it. So I just thought, okay, I have these insights. This was, it was valuable. And now I'm like, okay, I live and die by my calendar. How can I rethink and restructure my calendar of, am I building in enough buffer time so that I can meaningfully connect with people? Am I building in enough time where I'm, and protecting it where I can have the time learning? How do we look at our team goals and how do we check in and have accountability that we're honoring it for each other and our growth and development? And so what it did is it opened up when we had our quarterly offsite and we're talking about kind of how do we want to show up over the next quarter? It opened up a different conversation around how do we have accountability and support and kind of protect that for each other, you know, as a team. And I talked to someone else recently who did the 75 Vibes Challenge, and they were all challenged, and they were all about, oh, you have to write this down. I go, yeah, nah, no. It was great. And, like, it was counterproductive. Like, it's so funny. I'm like, this is defeating the point. I think the key for me is I think the areas are all important to pay attention to. And when you realize something's la- been lacking for you and you realize the impact when it's lacking and then 
on the flip side of that, the impact when you put attention to it and how much better you feel or how much more effective you are or whatever that is. I think that's that insight and the light bulb that when we're, we need to understand like, who do we need to be our best? And when I tend to those ingredients to be my best, the vibe I get off, give off, I think is far more who I want to be in the world. And when I'm ignoring those, the vibe I give off is like, stay the hell away from me. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Why do you think, or for you, right? Why do you think that that is so important, that connection piece, but why do you think you ignore it and allow yourself to go into busy, productive human doing versus human being? Like, is there like this, um, this like crossroads that you can identify that says, this is where I veer off and this is when I don't? Yeah. Well, and I mean, I could get into the whole thing of it. This is the work that we do every day. So one of the things in the work that we do is we talk about the fact that more often than not, our adult self is not who is in the driver's seat today. It is our, and I use 10 lightly because seven, eight, nine, 10, 15, well, those early years of our life that are very formative, we learn at a very young age how to look good and avoid looking bad. It's kind of, it's our, it's our species survival. And as we're doing that by observing our surroundings, our lived experiences, et cetera, our brains create a narrative or rules or programming about how the world works and where we're going to be accepted, where we're going to look good. And the problem is that programming that our brains download, studies have shown that 70% of that programming is fundamentally flawed. It's negative and it's self-sabotaging. And so I share that because the work that we do every day with leaders is actually helping them heal that narrative and understanding where that programming went astray and basically kick their 10-year-old self to the back seat so their adult self can show up, right? Because you wouldn't let your 10-year-old self drive a car or, you know, make a major purchase. And so I share that because I've done all this work on myself and I, despite it, I'm a human being. And if we think our, this work is done, like you're, you're in for a rude awakening. And so I know like I, from my early years of my life, I created programming that, you know, you, your value and you get praise by producing, getting stuff done, being the best. If you're not shining above, if you're not perfect, then there's something wrong with you. And so that is the flawed programming and narrative that I held for so many years. And here's, here's the problem with that is that that programming has a function. It has a purpose. It is designed to keep us safe. And that programming led me to getting multiple degrees. That programming led me to launching a successful business. That programming led to a lot of good, like, quote unquote, successful things that people would look on the outside, like, oh, you, you write books, you have a podcast, da, 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 da. And yes, it's certain, like, I have an incredible work ethic that serves me well. And it has a tipping point when it goes from serving me well, and if I don't pay attention to it and I don't, I haven't learned how to set boundaries or I don't protect those boundaries, then all of a sudden, oops, that 10 year old Rosie comes in that is like, no, 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 no. Like if I don't do this, that somehow there's something wrong with me, or I'm going to fail at this, or I'm going to be less than or whatever. And so that's where my default wiring is. I go to where I add value is by how much I accomplish and how much I get done. And when that's your wiring, guess what happens? It is so easy to then that flywheel of momentum picks up. And I coach so many successful leaders that on the outside, they're these, they're rocking it. And on the inside, they're tired and they're exhausted. And that's what happens to me. And so it's always recognizing like, oh, there it goes again. And I know that about me. And so I'm, I'm pretty good about being able to go, oh, nope, did it again. Here's, here's my lessons learned. And I'm a human being and despite doing all that work, but that's, that's where it comes from. And so I think we have to, we all have our own version, whether it's, I have to be in control, whether it's, I have to people please, but we all have these narratives and this flawed programming that keeps us from tending to the things that we actually know we need to be our best. And once we learn what those are, we can circumvent them better. Can you help help me understand or maybe tell me a story about a leader that you've worked with or an organization that you've worked with where you saw somebody make a huge transformation over like a tiny deliberate practice that you you know you you saw them and you saw them like being super productive and getting all the accolades for this thing but there was this deliberate practice they were slowly integrating to change 
themselves to find bigger purpose and meaning and like what that did to them and then their organization or their team. There's so many that come to mind because, again, this is the work that we do every day. And, and so there, there's one um, that comes to mind. And we actually write about this person in um, our book. And she let us tell her story, but she wanted us to change the name. So we called her Christine um, in our book. But so it was interesting because she was a leader and she had hit a crossroads in her leadership journey, which a lot of us do. And there was a lot that was happening in her personal life, which was causing an immense amount of stress which happens. And she didn't have a way to really process that or deal with that. And so the stressed version of herself was showing up at work to the point where there was complaints and um, HR got involved. It wasn't like horrible, but it was like, okay, this is not the you that we are um, used to. This is not the you we know you're capable of. And so the organization cared enough about her to say, we know you're going through stuff. We want to help you get back on track and we're going to invite you to engage in a coaching relationship. That's pretty cool that the organization even said that, right? We'll go back to that in a minute because that's like a whole yeah. other like, that's a whole other story versus like you're in trouble, but it's like, it's a, we're going to invest in you. We see this, which I think is a great way to do it. What it proactive is great. If someone's struggling, it's look, if we wanted you out the door, we'd just manage you out the door. But we really think that this is a tipping point, a crossroads, and we want to help you get past this, right? And we know that you're going to need some support to do it. The way she described it is after she was in a shame spiral for a little bit thinking, oh my gosh, I failed, right? There's something wrong with me. She decided to say, you know what? I am going to take this as a gift and an opportunity. And I'm just, I'm going to lean in and I'm going to lean in and do this work, which not everyone likes, not everyone will do that. So she decided first and foremost, she had a mindset of, you know what, I'm going to lean in and take this as an opportunity. Everyone hits a juncture in their leadership journey. How cool is it that my organization is supporting me? Like shift my mindset versus I suck. I'm bad because I am being asked to be coached. Right. So that's the first step. And then as we did the work together, you know, she started to realize again, that flawed programming because of various things that had happened when she was growing up she created her own narrative that her needs needed to go to the back seat, that she doesn't matter, that she can't appear selfish, that she, her role is to take care of everybody else. She can't set boundaries. She can't whatever. And so what was happening is she was taking on everything leading to burnout and stress because she had this narrative of, I can't say no, I can't, I can't, right? Like never unplugged when she was on vacation, like the list goes on and on. Well, when you have no boundaries and your self-care goes out the window, at some point you're going to snap. And so as we did this work and uncovered, you know, that this was her narrative and it was like, whole, oh, and she actually realized that she was holding like this level of needing to be responsible for everyone around her at like a life and death level, which was also a huge like aha for her. So it's like, we need to calm your nervous system and get this off of a life and death level. And you're not 10 years old anymore. You're not, you know, 15 and help your brain realize that because her brain was, you know, stuck there. And what she started to do when you talk about small practices, as a result of this, it, we started small. Like, you know what? You already had scheduled time off. Don't accept meetings that get put on your calendar, right? Because she would accept everything. What if you start, don't check emails one evening a week? Like we started really, really small with boundaries. And the whole thing was that the narrative in her brain would tell her that doing that somehow she was going to get in trouble, be less than, not be effective. And little by little, when the worst we imagine doesn't happen because it didn't, it was easier to now not check emails for an entire weekend, now to actually honor your paid time off. And what was interesting is as she started to set better boundaries and delegate and say no and basically advocate for herself and her needs, her team started thriving. And she got to the point that she was ready for what's next. And she left and got like a chief uh, level position in another organization. But it was the leaning in and realizing, oh my gosh, I can advocate. I can set boundaries. And she started, I call it the flywheel of momentum, but she had to find a, an opening that was small and risky, but safe enough, if that makes sense. And then with each time that momentum just built, but she had to identify why she wasn't doing that and go, oh. Okay. <laughs> so it's interesting. So Tim Ferriss has this really short video on YouTube about fear setting. And it's very similar to that, right? Of like, okay, what are you afraid of? And like, let's go there first. And then let's back into that. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Okay. And then how do you set yourself up so that, that, that actually like you have, you know, plan A, B, C, D. And that sounds like what those 
you know, deliberate practices where it's like, okay, let's just start out like, let's actually like hypothesize for a minute. Like, is that actually going to happen or is that just in your own head? I mean, and that that's real. That's really what it is. And it's so funny because you're right. All of these scripts that we have, these self-limiting stories are all fear-based. It's something bad's going to happen. People are going to think whatever. They're going to think I'm selfish. They're going to not like me. They're going to reject me. They're going to, right. We have these, uh, we have these core fears. And until we learn to acknowledge and recognize what our own fears are, and then look at kind of what's the rules then that we've created that are self-protective in nature so those fears kind of don't happen. It keeps our world fairly small. It keeps our world fairly safe. Like I said, like in my case, it it benefits you to a point. So there's also a trade-off. We have to recognize, well, I get a, I get a benefit by like, you know, me working my butt off. Yeah, I get all this stuff done. But here's what it does is like it keeps me from having to feel. Yeah, I lock myself in my office so that I just like close myself off to the outside world. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So we get some kind of benefit and trade off that we sometimes don't want to admit to ourselves. But so it's kind of like the is the cost worth continuing to hold on to this? Right. So the way that I always phrase it is when we can identify whatever our self limiting stories are in newsflash, we all have them. So if you're pretend you don't like you're not human, but um, is this story still true today? And is it still serving me and others? And I think if we can start to ask those two questions, that's how we can start to be more deliberate. And instead of that insecure, fear-based, 10-year-old version of ourself hijacking us, we can go, well, maybe not because, you know, I'm fill in the blank. I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60 now. Like a lot has evolved since I was 10. And then what you said, her team began to thrive. So like, what do you think, or at what point was it in that change that started to make her understand that they were thriving? Well, I think one, they just started stepping up more. If you think about it, if you have a leader that is taking everything on and not giving you an opportunity to contribute or not giving you an opportunity to learn and grow, it's kind of defeating and deflating. So one, with her setting boundaries, it's realizing, hmm, I can't do everything, which means I have to start to lean on others and lean on my team. And I think they appreciated the opportunity. The other is if you think about it, I don't know anybody who, when they're totally stressed and burnt out, has a vibe or an energy or a demeanor about them that fosters connection and you know what I mean? And good communication. And so as she started to chill the heck out, <laughs> right? The vi- the vibe around her was she was more approachable and, t- you know, that they could figure stuff out, that there was more collaboration. You know, I was talking about like, uh, you know, we have to think about it of an N of one. Like we are an N of one and we're all unique. That N of one can have a ripple effect pretty quickly and pretty powerfully. And, you know, we all either contribute or contaminate our our work team culture. And she was inadvertently contaminating it. And as she started showing up differently, and because she also happened to be the leader of the team and has the largest influence, you started to see that ripple effect actually pretty darn, pretty darn quickly. And then there were other people that were then became like protective of her. Like, no, like, don't, you're not scheduling that on her. No, we're going to take that because they didn't want the old version of Christine (laughs) to show back up so interesting how that I know I even know for myself right when I'm like stressed or in that productive mode of like checking the box of like the to-do list I I forget like the niceties of engaging in a conversation so like hey how was your weekend or hey like how you doing I just go straight in for the answer that I need to extract and it's like who wants to interact with somebody like that? Right. Well, yeah. And you're not, it's awful. And here's the thing is you're not seeing the person behind it. And then you miss cues that someone might be not having a good day or someone might be struggling, but they feel like they can't tell you because you've created no space to see the person behind the function. Yeah. And, and when you think about it, it's like super self-serving, right? Like, so your, your care and concern for other people is really not even there. It's for yourself of like, I need to get this done and I need to do this thing. It is a core human need that we all have to feel like we matter and to feel like we're heard and seen. So when someone just comes in and blatantly, and here's the, even saying, how was your weekend? If it's, you know, if it's like a nicety though, to get to like, I actually don't care. Like versus if someone actually authentically checks in, like, how are you doing? Like, no, I actually care. And I'm going to spend time there. 
before the agenda, it makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. Versus someone coming in, where's this, where's this, where's this, where's this? And yeah, am I going to speak up and say, oh my gosh, I never mind because they don't have the ear for it and they don't care. Now I'm just going to go in the corner and hide my struggles. Definitely. Yeah. There's going back to like the definition of a vibe. It's like the feeling or the energy, right? Like how you say it or like the, the feeling behind it matters because people are going to feel that energy regardless if you try to hide it because it leaks out. It just leaks out. We know we we know if someone's being real and genuine with us versus it like a check the box like I love leaders like oh I was told that I'm supposed to ask my employees how they are so yeah or you know or ask about their weekend and you can tell though they're going through like a checklist and there's no like authentic connection or authentic listening or anything there yeah okay so tell me a little bit about I guess more systematically right and how you go about and working with your clients in creating the right atmosphere or vibe, or maybe not even for your clients, but even within your own team, right? What does that look like to you? What are some of the values that you guys stand behind? And what does that look like? That's a great question. And I am going back to this deliberate practice thing. Like if any company, um, and I would say as human beings, individuals as well, but there's one thing to profess our values and it's another to actually practice them. And so I think it's really critical to, if we're going to actually practice our values and use our values consistently as a filter for how we show up, we have to go from having a word identified that's the value itself to what are the behaviors that tell me I'm in alignment with that value and I'm out of alignment. And then as a collective organization, what are some of the behaviors that tell us we're in alignment and out of alignment of that behavior? And I think that's a really critical thing. And, you know, one of our core values is that we have to connect as human beings first. It's all about community building. That's that's huge. And so when we think about, like, what does that look like? So we have regular meetings about, you know, are we meeting enough? What's our meeting cadence? Do we need to change it? How does that need to look so we feel connected? You know, so we're having that open discussion because we are virtual. And even in person, just because you see people doesn't mean it's a meaningful connection. And then we start all of our team huddles and check-ins with a two-word check-in. How are you feeling today? Like authentically, how are you feeling? And someone might be like, I'm exhausted, but I'm hopeful. Or, you know, I'm caffeinated and ready or, you know, whatever. But here's what I will tell you is on, on all fronts, when you you open up, you know, your Zoom or whatever it is and you see someone's face and you're like, again, the vibe, you can tell. I don't know what word's going to come out of their mouth, but it's not going to be good. Or if the words that come out of their mouth are like the, oh, I'm hanging in, like, mm, my spidey sense is telling me there's something else going on. And then here's the thing. We lean in. What are you needing? How can I support you? Like sometimes the agenda has to be sidestepped because when a person is in a place of struggle, they can't be effective. And it's not that they're a bad, it's like they're a human. And so one of the things that we do is we have a very deliberate practice of checking in first. And then sometimes the agenda that we have kind of goes out the window so that we can make sure that that person is set up for success. Um, that's just, that's one simple thing we do. When you talk about reflection, we've been very open about this. Um, I took a cue from Amy Emmonson. Um, every Friday when we do our Friday reflection from the week, we look at, you know, what were our highlights from the week so we can celebrate. And then we do F up Fridays. What's our biggest F up from the week? Um, what's our squiggle detour? And what do we learn from it? And and we're open about it. And I go first because I'm the leader, right, to set the tone. But here's what's awesome about it is that some of our best process improvements have come from our F up Friday shares. I love that. That is so, so cool. Can you talk to me about what one of them was just out of curiosity? Oh, well, so going back to like the 75 vibes thing, on more than one Friday, by the way, my F up Friday <laughs> has been the, I did not honor my calendar or my boundaries this week, whether it was like self-care or reflection time or whatever it was, it was, or I overpacked or I did too much back to back or whatever. So my calendar had worked against me this week. And my lesson learned is that doesn't work well. So here's what, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to rechange how things are scheduled in my calendar. So that's been more than one of like, because now I get to the end of the week and here I am, I'm going to end up having to work on the weekend because I didn't get this thing done, or now I'm stressed out, or that wasn't the quality I thought it could be. 
And so that's actually led to us talking about now, okay, you know what, now our Fridays, we actually reflect on what the goals we set and priorities we set for that quarter. And we look at how are we doing and where are we at and what do we need? And we celebrate like, yay, you honored your time for development. Yay, you honored your self-care. And so, yeah, so that's actually helped with prioritizing so that that's one. And then I think with other ones, like with, with, we have um, big processes going on with a couple of our clients with like these talent assessments and talent reviews and trying to really help figure out their leadership bench strength. And there's a lot of moving parts with that. And, you know, nothing hugely got dropped, but like stuff got missed or confusion of where are we here and having to ask the same question four times. And so from F up Friday reflections, it was like, you know what, we need to work with a client to have a clear process, like an Excel spreadsheet that we're clear, whatever, because this back and forth is like, nope, we need to, we need to streamline this more. And again, that came from an, um, an F up Friday so we can better serve our clients and have our sanity and be clear of what we're doing. So those are a couple just simple, but they're, I mean, that's, that's where improvements come from. And if you're not actively talking about it and mining for it, you miss those opportunities. I get a lot in my, in my work, a lot of leaders who will ask like, yeah, that sounds great in practice. And if everybody's mature enough to have that conversation, but have you experienced somebody on your team or with leaders that you've you've led that have somebody that use those types of opportunities to excuse a behavior for themselves, like excuse their performance or fall into this like victim mentality. Um, and if so, I think that'd be really important too. Like how is that handled to, to get back to the intent of what you're trying to achieve during those meetings? I think that's a good question. And so first of all, I think, um, and what we do and what I recommend for any of uh, the leaders that we work with, because formal leaders set the tone for psychological safety and for the culture, I always say that when you're when you're sharing celebrations and highlights or peak of the week, you go last, right? It's like you're not filling up the space. You go last when it's celebratory. You go first when it's being vulnerable and putting your butt on the line and admitting mistakes because you're setting that tone. So leader goes first on screw ups, goes last on on the cel- celebrations. And so here's the thing is I did have one leader who he didn't like F up, but he wanted to call it mess up Fridays. I'm like, I don't care what you call it. Like again, don't get in, don't, don't let the process get in the way, right? Of the intent. Right, exactly. And I'm like, my vibe is more F up, yours is more mess up. I don't really care. But here's what's interesting as we would have regularly regular coaching sessions and I would ask him how the mess up Friday went he would just like say, okay, well, here's where I messed up this week. And then how about the rest of you? And I said, but you didn't share the learning. It doesn't do you any good to share. Here's where I screwed up. If you're not saying here's the valuable lesson that, you know, and either the support I want from you or what I'm going to try next, like you're showing like the growth mindset learning. And he also didn't set the expectation that, no, this is something I really want us all to do. And Maybe you don't consider it a big old mess up, but it's like a squiggle or a detour or something didn't quite go the way you want because you're trying to normalize having that open conversation. And I said, sometimes you're going to have to kind of mine for it and maybe give them two or three weeks and then be like, okay, like there, you cannot tell me in the last three weeks that there have been no sidesteps, squiggles, detours, like not possible. I've shared some with you. Honestly, I want to hear like, and I don't think he was doing that. It was like, so we had to kind of tweak of, how you set the tone makes a makes a huge difference and how you invite others into that conversation makes a huge difference. And I just like, I have it in the meeting calendar invite. Here's the agenda. Like everybody knows F up Friday is coming. And then now we've actually gotten where it's like, okay, forget Friday. It's F up Friday on a Tuesday. Here we go. I'm starting early this week, right? <laughs> but But we're sharing them more like, okay, what can we learn from this? Oh, this is super helpful. And now it becomes like an ongoing dialogue. So I think as leaders, you have to set the tone, but you have to be cognizant. Oh, am I trying to like, I don't know, have people go, oh, that's okay. You did that. Like, no, I'm owning that this was a missed opportunity, a misstep. Here's the learnings I'm taking from it. Anything else that, you know, that you see or whatever, and you show you're willing to take in that feedback. And so he, it took him a few tries because his self-protective nature was trying to you know, keep him from it. He's like, he's supposedly doing it. No, he really wasn't. But I think eventually he started to uh, lean in and understand, oh, okay. And you know, it's just part of being human because it's, it's not comfortable to go, hi, I screwed up. But how do you, how do you learn and grow? Right. So I think that safety is really key to that, right? Is like, even the leader, if it's a, it's a formal leader, right? Of them feeling safe enough with their team or their 
their leadership team that they report into to put that out into the wide open because there are organizations where that is used as blackmail. Oh yeah, well it, it will be retaliatory and that's why the leader has to go first because leaders have to create that space of psychological safety and if you're going to ask somebody else to step into the arena to use Brene Brown's metaphor and to be vulnerable, you you have to model it first. And if there is a history of retaliation and whatnot, and maybe it's not from you, maybe it's from a previous leader and people have kind of PTSD or something. But that's why like with this guy, like you're going to have to do it multiple times to show that you're modeling what you're asking them. And also like if you keep bringing it back to the learning and keep bringing it back to the learning they will eventually hopefully lean in, but you might have to um, nurture it for a bit because there is a, this is so different for them, or that's not how you used to show up. So they have a bit of fear. So you have to make it safe for them and, and retrain them, if you will, how to interact with you in a different way. Okay. So if you could give, you know, advice, if there's somebody listening and you could say, there's one thing that you really suggest that they start doing. What is that one thing that you've learned over time um, that is really a great place for the majority of leaders or, or, you know, formal or informal leaders to start? I love this question. And I will say it's, it's two things, but it's, it's a part one, part two. And the first thing that we have to start practicing over and over and over is building our muscle to pause that we have to pause before we react, pause before we send the email, pause before we open our mouth. The pause, sometimes we have to slow down to speed back up. And why learning to pause is so critical is it disrupts the reactivity that inherently shows up in our brain that has us showing up in that self-protective, let's say 10-year-old self, or showing up in ways that we're going to regret that aren't going to serve us well. And then I would say the second thing is once you pause, I think that we have to start to be very, very cognizant of what is the story I'm telling myself right now. And so if we start pausing and go, okay, well, the, what's the story I'm telling myself about this person, about this situation? Because as soon as we recognize I'm telling myself a story, then we can go back to that. Is the story true? How could I find out if it's true? And is the story actually serving me well? And we can't own that we're telling ourselves a story if we don't pause. So they really go hand in hand. It's like, I got to take that deep breath and pause and then go, okay, what is the story I'm telling myself right now? And then you can sometimes laugh at yourself because that story is so freaking ridiculous. You're like, seriously? <laughs> but then it allows us to not act on that story. So then it allows us to be in a space of acting with intentionality rather than reacting on a fear-based, self-protective based place that isn't helpful. I'm not sure if I shared with you or not, but I tried to remove the word busy from my vocabulary because I just found myself using it so much. And then I think we like live up to the expectations that we put out into the world too. So I'm like, well, I, I'm busy because I've created the busyness. So I like the busyness. So when somebody asks me how I am, why do I tell them, oh my God, I'm just crazy busy. I actually got like, you know, sometimes you need physical reminders to help you pause. So I got this bracelet that says pause and I got this other bracelet that says intention. So like on days that I especially feel a certain way or I know my calendar looks a little wild or something like that, I'll wear those so that it's like a physical reminder to do something that I might not otherwise do in the mess of the day. I'm a huge believer of finding ways, whether it's with a bracelet or, you know, people have something they hold on to or post-it notes around your computer or reminders that pop up on your phone. Because we are so hardwired for autopilot mode, finding ways to disrupt that autopilot and force us to pay attention is a really good way to start to build a, a deliberate practice because we have to find a way to kind of yeah, we have to find a way to disrupt that autopilot. That's the best way I can describe it. And so any of that stuff can be super, super helpful. Okay, so now we're going to learn a, a few things about you. I just have a quick little um, lightning round. Okay, beach or mountains? Beach. Day or night? Give me vitamin D all day long. And oh my God, I'm a happy camper. Anyway. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, Netflix or like a live theater? I mean, I love going to a live theater if I have time, but Netflix when you can just like sit on the couch with the dogs and like, you know, be in, look like a hobo in pajamas and whatever, like that could be really fun. So. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> totally. All right. So Rosie, thank you so much. Where can people find you if they're interested in learning more about all the great work that you're doing? 
Yeah, so there's a few places. So one, uh, I had alluded to some of these little Rosie in my pocket videos, like the crazy busy and the stories. So we have those archived on my YouTube channel. So if you just look up Dr. Rosie on YouTube, the Rosie in my pocket series, usually we release a new one every Thursday. You can follow me on LinkedIn. New stuff comes out that way. Also, uh, salveopartners.com. Instagram and Facebook are also Dr. Rosie Ward. Wow, incredibly refreshing to catch up with Rosie and hear simple practices to help elevate your personal and organizational vibes. It was super cool to hear how she encountered the 75 Vibes Challenge and what she learned about herself and her needs in the process. I loved hearing about how 75 Vibes helped her refocus on connecting with people as a deliberate practice, and she switched from human doing meaning just checking the box of each of the five daily practices of 75 Vibes, to human being, which allowed her to really understand what she was missing and integrating that back into her flywheel of momentum. Incredible insight. If Rosie has inspired you to take action on improving your vibe, I suggest downloading 75 Vibes and getting started today. If this episode inspired you and you want to see how you can take the next step to creating a better vibe within your organization, I'd love for you to download our complimentary 75 Vibes worksheet. This is a simple tool to create a habit and mindset around creating great vibes in work and life. The best part, it's simple and it works.